Are you looking for a quick tutorial to get you up and running as fast as possible in Blender? Well, you're in the right place. Let's get started. If you haven't already, hop on over to blender.org to download and install Blender. Load it up and you'll see the splash screen. Select the options that work for you and you'll see the basic default scene. Here you see three objects, a camera, a light, and the default cube. It's technically a complete scene that is ready to render. Every object in your scene will be listed in the outliner over here. Objects can be renamed and arranged in collections in the outliner. The outliner also shows what objects and collections are visible in the viewport or render output. Back in the viewport, Shift A will bring up the Add menu. Any object type can be added from here, but let's continue with the default cube. Left click on the cube to select it. See how it has a yellow border now? Hold Shift and left click another object. The last of the selection is now yellow, while the one selected before it is orange. The yellow selection is the primary or active selection. Left click and drag will box select multiple objects. Other selection types like lasso are found at the top of the tool panel on the left hand side of the viewport. The toolbar can be shown or hidden by tapping T. Two other selection shortcuts to know are A, which selects all visible objects, while Alt-A deselects all. Okay, deselect everything except the cube again. At this point, you probably want to know how to look around this 3D world you're peering into. There are three primary ways in which we move around the viewport. The first is orbit. Hold middle click while moving the mouse around to do so. To pan, add shift. Finally, scroll up and down on the mouse wheel to zoom in and out. The number pad also gives us our directional view choices. Press 5 on the numpad to toggle perspective and orthographic. Numpad 0 is the active camera view, 1 is front, 3 is right, 7 is top, and pressing shift with any of these is their opposite. If you prefer a pie menu for this, you can press tilde, that's the squiggly key in the upper left of your keyboard. Now let's move our objects around the 3D space. Select the cube if you have not already, and tap G to grab. You can now move your mouse around and the cube will follow. This is not very accurate though. Left click or press enter to let go of the cube. Grab the cube again, but this time tap X, Y, or Z to constrain the movement to one of these axes and let go of the cube. Lastly, tap shift with one of those axes to exclude it. These constraints also work with the other transforms. Scale, which is activated by tapping S, and rotate, which is R. The exact information about any transform result can be seen or manually typed in the item tab of the viewport side menu. Press N or click this arrow next to the view gizmo if it is not visible. All of these transforms can be given positive or negative values. Zero and negatives can be used in interesting ways with the scale transform in particular. Back to the subject of rotation. Rotate the cube in some random way. This will allow us to demonstrate one more way to constrain our transforms. Use G to grab the already selected cube and double tap X, Y, or Z. Now you are constraining the transform to the object's local axis rather than the global or world axis. Shift double tapping an axis will exclude it from the local transform. And just as before, this works the same for scale and rotation. Now press Alt G to zero the cube's position and Alt R to zero its rotation. Alt S will do the same for scale if you change the scale at any point. Congratulations, you've just completed what is probably the most complicated part of the basic interface. Now let's turn our attention to edit mode. Tab toggles between object mode, where you manipulate objects, and edit mode, allowing the components of a mesh object, like vertices, edges, and faces, to be manipulated. Selection works the same here as it does in object mode, with some added ways to select larger numbers of components. The most basic component is the vertex. Vertices are not 3D themselves, but exist in 3D space in that they have an X, Y, and Z position. No one vertex has an individual rotation or scale. A connection between two vertices makes an edge, and the area between three or more edges is a face. All of the selection methods and transform types that we have already discussed work in edit mode with all three of these component types. However, you must tell Blender which of the component types you want to work with at the moment. Pressing 1 along the top of your keyboard in edit mode will start vertex selection. Press 2 for edge selection, or 3 for face selection. 
holding Shift with any combination of the three will activate multiple selection types at once. This is a good time to talk briefly about normals. Without going into too much detail, if you are new to 3D, the normal of a face is its front side. You can quickly see which way normals are facing by turning on the normals overlay in the overlays menu, in which case the outside of the face will be blue and the back face will be red. Alternatively, you can turn on back face culling from the same menu, which simply makes back faces invisible. A newly created object is usually displayed with flat shading. This means that every face is displayed with its individual surface normal. Right-clicking in object mode allows us to select smooth shading, which averages the normals of all faces. This is useful for curved surfaces where you would not want the faceted look of flat shading. Before we dive into more advanced ways to select components, let's cover some of the basic tools to add some geometry to work with. First, let's extrude a face of this cube. Left-click a face, tap E for extrude, and move your mouse. Clicking or pressing enter commits the change you just made. Alternatively, you could type the distance to extrude after pressing E and strike enter. This order of activate tool, modify active tool, click to finish is the same for every tool with few to no exceptions. Control R will activate loop slice. This will add edges to your mesh according to what edge your mouse cursor is closest to. Scrolling up and down will change the number of edges to add. Click and you can slide the new edges or simply double click to finish. What if you slide the edges and you did not want to? Just strike enter. Speaking of doing things you did not want to do, like most other PC apps, Control Z is always undo, while Control Shift Z is redo. Use undo history in the edit menu to move through the history of actions. Moving on, select an edge and press Control B. This bevels the selected edge. Move the mouse to change the width of the bevel and scroll up and down to change the number of added edges. Before clicking to finish, take a look at the footer of the viewport. This area lists all the available functions to modify your active tool. Click to finish. Bevel also works on vertices. Select a vertex and press Ctrl B, followed by V. The rest works the same as when beveling an edge. Fill fills a hole with a face. Select two or more edges or three or more vertices and tap F to create a face. Filling between two vertices creates an edge. The last of the basic tools we will look at right now is inset. To inset a face or faces, make a face selection, tap I, move your mouse and click to finish, or type a distance and strike enter. If your selection is bordered by an open edge, press B while using the tool to exclude that edge from the inset operation. Of course, we do not want to only add geometry to our mesh all of the time. We can also delete it with either the X key or the delete key. In object mode, X will ask for confirmation when deleting an object, delete will not. In edit mode, both X and delete will bring up the delete menu, asking what or how to delete in relation to your selection. I could spend a bunch of time explaining the use of each of these, but I recommend that you just play with them and see how they work. You will use each of them in some scenario or another. Another function that we could say is related to deleting is merging. The merge menu is invoked by pressing M after selecting the geometry you want to merge. I do have a video linked above that does cover the various merge options. Now that we have a bunch of geometry to work with and know the basics of selection and transforms, let's take a look at some more selection methods in edit mode. First is loop selection. Alt-click an edge while in edge selection, and you will see that the entire loop that the edge is a part of is selected. This is useful if you want to manipulate an entire loop, which brings us to another tool related to both edges and vertices, and that is slide. We know that G will simply grab and move the selection, but if you double tap G, the selection now moves along its connected edges. Tapping C while sliding allows the selection to move past the end of the edge. Now let's add control to our alt click. This selection is a ring. This is really only relevant to edges, while loop selection applies to all three component types. If one element is selected, and another is control clicked, 
then everything along the shortest path between them is also selected. Control Numpad Plus expands the current selection to connected geometry, while Control Numpad Minus shrinks the selection, and Control I will invert your selection. There are also a few visibility commands to help you out when geometry is in the way. Shift H hides everything but the selection. H hides the selection, and Alt H unhides everything. These commands, as well as the invert selection, work in both object and edit modes. Now that you're feeling pretty confident with the basics of transforms, selection, and a few tools under your belt, let's complicate it all with origins and pivot points. We'll start with origin points. Tab out of edit mode into object mode. You have probably already noticed this dot in the center of the object. That is the object's origin point and is the point from which its position, rotation, and scale are determined from. The origin can be moved by right-clicking and selecting one of the set origin options from the resulting context menu. One item that is very useful when setting the origin or manipulating objects and components is the 3D cursor. The 3D cursor is this red and white circle. It is where new objects in object mode or new geometry in edit mode is created. It is also useful as a reference point for many functions in Blender. Shift right click will place the 3D cursor at your mouse cursor. It can be difficult to place it precisely in 3D space with this method, but it is a quick and easy way to place it in a general location on a surface if that's all you need. Shift S will show the rest of the common 3D cursor functions in a pie menu. The view tab on the viewport side menu also allows manual placement of the 3D cursor. At the top center of the viewport header, you will find the Transform Pivot Point dropdown. Click it and select 3D Cursor. Now place the 3D cursor somewhere and scale or rotate the mesh object. The usefulness of this becomes apparent very quickly. While we are clicking things in the viewport header, take a moment to click through the other dropdowns that exist there. Transform Orientation, Snapping, and Proportional Editing. Again, play with the various options there. Their uses mostly become evident when using them. One note on the proportional editing menu would be that adjusting the falloff distance of the selection is determined by scrolling up and down. At the right hand end of the header, you'll find view and overlay options, as well as shading options. One button to note here is X-ray view. X-ray can be turned on and off with Alt-Z. This function allows the selection of objects and geometry that would otherwise be hidden in solid shading view. Wireframe shading activated by Shift-Z affords the same advantages without showing faces. Viewport shading can also be selected from the Z pie menu. One giant feature set of Blender which we have not yet covered and which directly contributes to it being the best 3D software available is the modifier stack. Modifiers are a way to make procedural changes to a mesh. They are procedural in that the result of one modifier is the point at which the next modifier picks up and performs its function, then the next, and so on. For instance, if I were to add a subdivision surface modifier to this mesh, it would subdivide every polygon on the mesh once, or twice, or however many times are needed for the desired result. Notice that if I tab into edit mode, no actual change has taken place on the underlying mesh. Let's say I did not want this cube to become a blob. I can add some supporting edges with loop slice or bevel so that the subdiv modifier can make tighter corners, but that defeats the purpose of procedural modeling. Rather than bevel the edges destructively, I can add a bevel modifier to the stack and place it before the subdiv modifier. Now I have a cube with beveled edges and more subdivisions than the base mesh actually has. I can continue to edit my mesh and see the results in real time. I can even add and remove more modifiers as needed. Now that we know how to model the shapes of objects, we need to make them look like something more than gray objects. While you can light your scene with light objects, you will also need to set up the world from the world tab. By default, it is just an even middle gray. Clicking this yellow dot, will show options for the sort of world you want to set up. A common setup is to select environment texture and assign an HDRI image. Of course, your models are nothing without giving them some kind of material for appearance. This is a huge subject, but here are a few of the basics. 
Split your screen and open a materials editor. Make sure that you have selected a mesh object in the 3D viewport and change the view type to material or rendered. You can assign a name for your material here. This node is a shader that is the basis of most physically based render, or PBR, materials. The principled BSDF shader can be used on its own for very simple materials or with textures and images that affect the various sliders. Not all of the attributes here are used in every material. In fact, you will mostly be using base color, metallic, roughness, normal, and emission. In order to have an image or video file of your scene, you will need to render it. The point of view from your active camera is the view from which your scene will be rendered. This TV looking icon is the render settings tab. This is where you will set which render engine to use. Blender comes with two built in. Use Cycles for realism or Eevee for real time renders. If you have a GPU, you will want to set that as your device. If GPU is not available but one is installed, it will need to be enabled in settings. Samples basically translate to how long the render engine will spend on a frame before denoising or moving on to the next frame. More samples result in less noise but a longer render time. The sample count can be set differently for the viewport and the actual render output. There are a number of ways to denoise a render result, but if you have an RTX card, checking this box is often the best. This printer icon is the Render Output Settings tab. Here you can set the image or frame size the frame rate if you are creating an animation, and the output location as well as the file format. Eventually, you will want to modify some aspects of the interface to fit how you work. There are predefined layouts for various stages of a general workflow organized by tabs across the top. However, the layout is fully customizable. To open another editor, simply click and drag a corner of an existing editor and click this menu in the upper left to set which function it will serve. Dragging edges of editors resizes them, while dragging a corner over another will close the one being dragged over. Remember that the layout and settings of Blender can always be reset by clicking File, Defaults, Load Factory Defaults. Two settings I do recommend changing right from the start are 1. The number of undo steps available and two, set your GPU as the compute device for cycles and optics if you have the hardware for it. Both are available in the system portion of settings. We have of course only scratched the surface of what Blender can do, but these are the basics that you will use to follow any tutorial and create any project. Please let me know in the comments if this has been a help to you, and don't forget to give it a like and subscribe to the channel for other tutorials. Until next time, I'm Carl with BlenderForge. Happy blending.